I, uh, my second town hall I've ever done last week in Leesburg was the first one I've ever done. I, uh, first I'll explain that I have a horrible bark on my face. It looks like I hit a buzz saw, but really I bought a new razor and I have sensitive skin. So if you're wondering why my face looks so red, it's because I bought a new razor. But uh, anyways, I'm Anthony Sabatini. I'm your state representative, District 32. District 32 is two-thirds of Lake County. It's uh, top of Leesburg all the way down to Fort Warner, so we're kind of in the middle of the district right now. And uh, just a real quick, a little bit about myself. I grew up here in Lake County, love Lake County, went to public school here, went to UF, college and law school, went back, and on the city commission in Eustis, and then ran for this spot about a year ago, and won last fall, and became your state rep in November. And then, of course, we did our first session, which started in March, ended in May, Many weeks, a couple of weeks before that, finished uh, about a month ago, and uh, decided I wanted to do some town halls. Uh, there's five legislative figures in Lake County, there's three house reps, two senators, and uh, we do one big town hall. I think it's going to be in August this year. But I want to make sure I do one for myself in case people have questions for myself, or you know, I just want to be more accessible. I think that one's moderated. I don't like moderators, I just like to be able to talk to everybody. And uh, I did one in each of the two big cities, Claremont and Leesburg. So I did Leesburg one last week and this week's Claremont. So what I learned from last week is, because I came in, I'm like, we kind of went right through the Q&A. There was a few questions, but I think people expected more of an overview or kind of bigger picture of what you guys did for the last six months. Because I'm sure most of you were not following what the uh, state legislature was doing for the last six months. So. I'm going to start off by just kind of going over the budget, talking about some of the bigger bills and ideas and what we did this year, and then we can go to the Q&A. And if you have a, a question that you really can't, don't think can wait, just ask me right now or just raise your hand and I'll go to you. But in the meantime, I'll start off with this overview because I think it'll prompt better questions. And uh, I just want to introduce my staff real quick. Amanda Gels is my district executive secretary. She worked for Judge Larry Matz, my predecessor. Did a great job. She's still with me. So if you ever have an issue about the state agencies or anything here in the district or just any kind of problem whatsoever, call my office and Amanda will be uh, your guide. And then in, in Tallahassee, if you ever come to Tallahassee to see me or we're working on a bill that has a statewide interest, Jason Carter with the Florida Tie back there is my aide, uh, my right hand man. We're on the 11th floor of the Florida Capitol. Please come see us. So those are my two staff. And then as you but out here is, uh, is a little guy that uh, speaks about some of the bills I got passed this year and the appropriations I got for Lake County. And then this bigger one is really just a rough, comprehensive overview of the bigger bills that the House Majority Office, the Republicans uh, in Tallahassee put together talking about some of the key legislation that passed this year. And then if you really want to dig into it, feel free to come up here and grab this guy. This is the session summary. This is Literally everything that we did this year, we passed 195 bills, we passed a $91 billion budget, and this will give you a really in-depth analysis. It's right here. We have one extra copy, so please feel free to come up and grab it if you really want to look through, and that's what I'll be reading from and going through as I talk about some of the things we did this year. And then finally, my business card. I put my cell phone on every one of my business cards. So if you ever have a question or want to be privately, call me anytime or text me. And my office is literally, I think, a quarter mile from here, uh, right next to the Citrus Tower. So first I want to talk a little bit about the budget. Like I said, it was a $91.1 billion budget. And as, if you watch the news, you would know that you know uh, the governor and the Florida legislature had a, a set of priorities, overlapping priorities, going into this year. And the I think the big dominant idea was uh, environmental funding. So if, if, if one thing took... Uh, first place aside with all the hurricane funding we did, which we did about $150 million of additional hurricane funding, uh, $270 million for a federal match grant for the Panhandle, uh, it was the environment. So we passed uh, $865 million in environmental funding. That was more than what the governor even asked for, and he went into the session with that as his number one priority. Uh, $50 million of that was Everglades cleanup. I think $50 million was beach cleanup. 50 or so for waterways, and just dozens of, uh, of millions of dollars spent in environmental projects all around the state, including some here in Lake County, uh, Lake Apopka, the same as the River Management District. 
here. So very proud about that. I'll just have one quick thing uh, on that real quick that I think affects some people in the room, some people in Lake County, which is the hydrilla issue we have. Thankfully, we secured a very healthy budget for aquatic plant management in Lake County. So uh, 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 I think it was like $40 million for the state of Florida. So now uh, I'll be giving everyone an update soon enough to see how much that money we pull back into Lake County to fix the hydrilla. If you don't know what hydrilla is, maybe you don't live on the lake, it's an invasive uh, aquatic plant that chokes out the lakes, and uh, it's just really bad for the lakes. And good for fish nesting, but not so good for boaters and other people who go to the lake. So you know, make sure we pull at least four or five, six million is what we need this year, I think, to manage the issue. And uh, that's that's part of the environmental funding that we did this year, FWC's funding. So some of the other important things in the appropriations budget, and I'll just go through the silos here, is. Uh, you know, every year we spend more money on education. The education budget went up about three and a half percent this year. And that's aside from all the charter schools, <coughs> different types of special alternative education funding you hear about. Traditional public school education, which I was a product of here in Lake County, goes up every single year. Uh, and so we spent, uh, I think, another over $250 per student a year this year, this year's education budget. We're going to be looking at a big tax cut uh, as part of the budget this year. Uh, there was the first hurricane uh, buying holiday that was just a few weeks ago. And so hopefully that helped out some folks. I know I stocked up on a few things during that time period, but um, tax, there's going to be a lot of, uh, there was a lot of tax cuts this year, including the commercial lease tax. If you lease commercial property, there was about a 0.2% tax cut uh, for commercial leases in Florida. And that's a unique tax that I don't think we should uh, have in Florida, but we've had for a long time. You get taxed extra if you lease commercial property in the state. So feel free to chime in anytime if you ever have any questions. I'm just going to kind of go through this very large and comprehensive guide for your fellow. So uh, five million for rural infrastructure grants, uh, about 150 extra million for uh, the budget. Uh, public defenders, uh, state attorneys. I, Volunteered there when I was in law school. Uh, we're gross underpaid. We brought their pay up to fifty thousand dollars this year. Uh, guardian ad litems, attorneys in that department are getting a, uh, a pay increase. We're quite proud of that. Everglades funding, as you know, was uh, one of the big uh, priorities this year. Thankfully, we pulled that off. Bright futures uh, increase of funding seventy five million. Pathways to career opportunities grant program. So talking about vocational education, we'll get there in just a second. Uh, an extra $10 million was used for competitive grants to make sure that uh, folks looking for apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships can get jobs in Florida uh, or those apprenticeships. So it's grant funding to basically provide vocational opportunities for students who know that that's what they want to do and uh, attract them to that uh, earlier on. Uh, one of my big things in the legislation of vocational funding, if I don't have your corner, Actually, you probably heard me talk about it. Uh, big fan of our state university systems, but there's a really big lost opportunity by not having folks uh, go and explore vocational opportunities. And uh, a lot of my friends who did growing up here in my county they did very well for themselves. So there's some bills that I'll, I'll bring up here in a moment that I think incentivize people to explore those. So uh, just in K through 12 education, as you know, uh, we did a very uh, expansive uh, expansion of the charter school program in Florida. We had the most robust of a fundamental believer uh, school choice, and that parents had the opportunity to send their kid where they choose to uh, above and beyond anyone else's concern. I think parents should be enabled with that. So we increased charter schools in Florida 300% of the federal poverty level. So basically almost a middle class family, roughly a middle class family can take their kids and if they want to obtain a voucher to send them to a private charter school, they would of course do this if the schools in their district were not good. Uh, and so I think that was something that I was very happy to work, work in the legislature with, work with the governor on it was a priority for him too. We expanded the Guardian program. Uh, that's a program that basically says um, school board should have the ability if they wish, so it's sort of a home school type issue, they wish find teachers in their own districts to arm the 144 hours of training uh, on firearms that they want for self-defense in common school campuses in case in the case of a mass shooter. 
So that was for two big hot fund items in the K through 12 uh, area. Moving right along uh, to healthcare, you might have heard about uh, Senate Bill 182, that's smokable marijuana. So there's an expansion of the marijuana program uh, in the state of Florida. So if you're on medical marijuana and uh, you were concerned that you weren't able to smoke it, because I think for some people it's the preferred method, uh, the state, I think, wisely got rid of the restriction on that. So we got rid of the law that was passed, I think, of two years ago, saying that there was no smokable marijuana. And so that was a, something that was think was smart. But one of the big priorities in the House, sticking in the healthcare field, uh, this year was health care reform. We always talk about health care insurance and the cost of insurance, but we rarely talk about the price of the delivery of health care and what it costs to deliver health care in the state of Florida. The good itself. So you go to a hospital and it costs so much money for one procedure. You think, well, why is that? Well, it's because, in, in my opinion, I think a lot of people in the House, there really isn't enough competition in the field. And so the House came in with a set of uh, priorities that were that was going to, I mean, in, I, ideally increase competition to drive to try to drive down costs. So I'll go through a few bills that we passed this year for that House Bill Seven, direct health care agreements. So this is a law in Florida that says you can have a direct health care agreement with a doctor outside of insurance. Um, but what we did this year is we moved it from just general practitioners, general care to specialty care. So all different types of medical arrangements you can go into a direct relationship with a doctor at a much, much, much cheaper cost uh, than getting health insurance. Uh, House Bill 21, probably one of the most, not one of the most publicly known bills, but obviously one of the most contested and popular and well-known bills in Tallahassee, House Bill 21, it repealed what we call the Certificate of Need Program in the state of Florida. So we had a law here in Florida since the summer that said if you want to open up a hospital, a general hospital, specialty hospital, nursing home, any of these sort of health care facilities, you have to get a permission slip from the state government before you do so. So it was really a, a massive regulation on the healthcare care marketplace. Because you literally could not just open up and sell a good. It was these types of goods and services, health care services, were treated fundamentally different from other ones. And so uh, I don't believe that that was a wise way to go. It was obviously very anti-competitive because uh, established Healthcare entities are able to fight the system, gain the system to make sure that uh, there wasn't going to be anybody opening up in their neighborhood to compete against them for the same people who want uh, health care. And so we repealed that this year, so it's gone. Uh, as of next week, I believe the beginning of July, so two weeks, or I'm sorry, June, uh, you're going to see just more hospitals opening up. And I've already heard that even here in Claremont, South Lake area, there's been a lot of the hospitals buying land and getting ready to start building more facilities. So you'll have more options when it comes to getting healthcare delivery, the things that, um, that we all need. So health insurance, right? This, the governor signed this bill four days ago. It's called the Patient Savings Act. House Bill 1113. Uh, this is personally one of my favorites. Basically creates a, a new program for department management services that says um, if you are given information on the cost of different healthcare services in the Florida, and you choose to actually get the one that's cheaper, the savings are going to go directly to you. Because right now, there really wasn't an incentive to somebody uh, to, to try to search the best and cheapest healthcare. And oftentimes, the best is the cheapest because it's the one that's being most often at that hospital, being done the most often at the hospital. So we've created a program where, you, through a flexible savings account or health reimbursement, uh, reimbursement account, you will literally get the money that you save your insurance company in the state of Florida by using the cheaper or, or you know, fiscally prudent health care service. Uh, once again, kind of a nerdy, wonky, policy-driven bill. You might have heard a little bit about it. You might not have heard everything about it. But it's extremely important. It's going to save us taxpayers a lot of money in the state of Florida. House Bill 19, this is the Pharmaceutical Drug Import Bill. This is a... Uh, one of my favorite bills, too, the governor made it one of his priorities. So we'll be importing drugs in the Florida. And you, and you, if you're like me, you probably wonder when this bill was presented. Well, I thought that was the law already, because I know people that literally do use Canadian drugs, etc. But there's some niche in the law, I'm not an expert on the background of it, but some people are able to import cheap drugs and sell these cheap drugs on the marketplace here in Florida. But generally, it's not allowed. Uh, the federal government is not allowed to ever. We almost got it passed in the 1990s uh, with Bill Clinton's president, actually, but uh, they assumed that there would be a danger and that there would be too many counterfeit 
drugs, uh, there really is no valid concern there. It's really scare tactics, and the pharmaceutical industry has been one of the ones fighting this bill forever and promoting some of those conspiracy theories. But uh, it's the law now in Florida, so if the federal government signs off on it, we already cleared it on the state uh, behalf. Hopefully our Congress people will actually get that bill done in, in D.C. and get together the executive branch to sign off on it so that way we can start affording cheaper drugs. And if you just Google the subject, you'll be blown away. I mean, we're talking drugs for two, three, five, ten dollars that are uh, overseas and here in the United States, the same companies are charging thousand or two thousand or three thousand. I mean, the fifth example of this was the EpiPen. You probably heard a little bit about the EpiPen. And uh, that was a, uh, I think probably the most abused, uh, abused uh, example of it. A good that is extremely cheap in one country and way more expensive than other countries. Senate Bill 426, so we're moving into state affairs here, local government, one of my favorite areas to uh, enact policy on in the state of Florida. And this is the Firefighter Cancer Presumption Bill. So, um, although truly it's a local issue because it's the contracts between state and uh, local, local governments and firefighter uh, departments, uh, the state decided that it was something that we needed to uh, fix statewide and make sure we had a uniform policy on. So, uh, in this state of Florida, from this point on, when a cancer, when a firefighter has been working at a fire department for five, at least five years, in good, uh, in good rapport with the department, not using tobacco, gets cancer, there's going to be a presumption that he got it through his duty because if you don't know, there's a gross uh, higher, I think it's something like 30, 40, 50 percent higher chance of a firefighter getting cancer than it most occupations. So proud of the fact that we got that passed this year and that local governments would be mandated to take care of those firefighters when they do fall into trouble in the line of duty. Uh, so House Senate Bill 7066, you probably all remember <coughs> what happened with Brenda Snipes and uh, the election systems in South Florida caused a lot of issues of statewide concern. So we did a little bit of a cleanup bill that basically gave the supervisor elections more time, more room to uh, do vote counting and make sure a lot of it's done uh, a little bit more in the public. It's a detailed bill. I encourage you to take a look at it. It's detailed here in the list. Um, and I think that's going to really solve the issues because, as you know, the votes were coming in from absentees and emergency ballots so late that the, the election itself got overextended. So this will be uh, a bill that helps us get the voting, vote counting done on the front end, and therefore we don't have these elongated elections. Um, state agriculture uh, kind of department, you might have heard about the hemp program, state hemp program, which I was a proud supporter of, Senate Bill 1020. So hemp is going to be legal in Florida come this summer. Uh, hemp is going to be legal, uh, you know, if you don't know, hemp is a close variant of, uh, well, it's a cousin to marijuana. And both cannabis plant that doesn't have the psychosomatic <coughs> active effect of THC that's located in marijuana. It has about a thousand percent less THC. It has trace amounts of THC in it. But the, the product itself is, is a very good industrial product that is a substitute competes well with cotton and all different types of materials for clothing. They can even build concrete products out of it. Uh, they call it hemp cream. Anyways, it's, just, it's really like a magical plant. And so thankfully, they decided at the federal level after the farm bill to actually allow this uh, this uh, product to be sold in the state of Florida. So the program will be created this summer. It'll be signed off by the government, federal government in the fall. And then come next summer, I think you're going to start seeing, or spring rather, you're going to start seeing 10 products in your stores. And that's good for Florida's economy. There's already the citrus farmers and a lot of farmers who are hurting and not being able to Central and South Florida, who I think are going to start using hemp to uh, replace what they have already. And I think you're going to start seeing of them, uh, an influx of them here in the state of Florida, in Lake County, too, along with traditional medical marijuana, as you might have heard, is already here. Senate Bill 82, this is a very minor bill, but I think it's an important bill because it does touch on property rights. Uh, Basically, no, makes it the case in Florida that if you want to grow a vegetable garden and put along with local government, it's preempted from regulating that. Uh, I don't think they have a, uh, a legitimate uh, a concern in regulating vegetables grown in your yard, but, but because we have raw local power in the state of Florida, we allow them to do so, and I think it led to some bad uh, 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 occurrences in South Florida. So long for sure, we took that ability away. So now if you want to grow carrots in your front yard, nobody can tell you otherwise. Impact fees, I'm 
bit of boring here with some of this stuff, but this basically makes it that when a local government takes your impact fees, they have to basically make sure that they need it first. They can't take it before you get your certificate of, uh, uh, not certificate of occupancy, but your, your certificate to build the building that they're charging the impact fee on. Uh, fee on. And so there's some really good pro, pro growth bills that we got through in that regard. Real quick, I just want to kind of go over my stuff and talk about some things I did. So, I had six committee assignments. If you grab this little shiny sheet, you'll see I was on the Commerce Committee, Gaming Control. Gaming Control. We almost had a gigantic gaming control bill this year that would have literally changed uh, all of gambling in Florida, but uh, we decided not to act, and so therefore nothing happened in that committee this year. But uh, there's an extremely high possibility that we'll pass a massive gaming control bill next year. We don't lose the money from the compact that we agreed with the Seminoles. So we have an agree agreement with the Seminole Nation uh, to split money. They run a very professional gambling operation. They give the state literally $300 million a year uh, just, to, just to be able to uh, sell gambling to make sure we don't have gambling in other parts of the state. We lost that money because we didn't do it. We did not come to an agreement this year. I think there was a, too many disagreements about sports betting. There's a uh, difference of opinion in the Republican Party about the expansion of gambling, sports betting in different parts of the state. So that prevented a, uh, an agreement with the symbols, but expect that to happen next year. I was also on the Government on Appropriations uh, Committee, uh, uh, Workforce Development, so like vocational and, and Workforce Grant Money uh, Committee, and then uh, Collective Good Bargaining Joint Committee, which we did not do anything this year in that committee. But so uh, you get to file six bills in the House. Uh, you can do repealer bills, which I did a few of those. You can do resolutions and deliver those. You can budget bills and deliver those. But in terms of like policy, ideas, big ideas, you only get six. So I was proud of the fact that four of my six passed the Florida House, which is definitely above batting average. It would have been five in the school board term limit bill. I filed uh, the appetite because of last year's explosive ballot with 13 different ballot questions. Uh, people just decided that even though they agree with the school board term limits in the House, they didn't want to just throw in another constitutional ballot idea at uh, Floridians who were, I think, fatigued at the amount of uh, ballot questions we had last year. So we put that one on pause. So anyways, I got four passed. Uh, the first is the one that, uh, well, two, so out of the four passed the House, two of them passed the House and the Senate, and both are expected to be signed by the governor in the next two weeks. Uh, one of them is a, sort of a minor bill, but definitely an important bill for about 50,000 Floridians. It made legal a certain pharmaceutical drug that contains CBD, cannabidiol. So uh, CBD is a uh, chemical you might have heard from the news and popular culture. Everyone kind of knows about CBD now, the signs are popping up. But it's a chemical that does have uh, positive medical effects for people with certain types of illnesses and diseases. So I ran a bill uh, that would have allowed CBD in a pharmaceutical drug for people with epilepsy to use in Florida. So ha happily that bill passed and about 50 to 100,000 Floridians are very likely to probably purchase and use this drug, which will help with their epilepsy. If you don't know, CBD is still illegal in Florida. It's also still illegal at the federal level. We have the class schedule. So class 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Class 1 drugs are highly regulated like marijuana, heroin, et cetera. Class 5 are like kind of uh, just general prescriptive drugs you get from your doctor. And this basically moved it from class 1 to class 5. And Hopefully, uh, I'm in the minority here in the Republican Party, but I believe we should move marijuana as a whole from class one to class five uh, because I just don't think we should be regulating that, uh, especially in a criminal, from a criminal uh, perspective any longer. But uh, that's a conversation I think Congress will have and will probably follow at the state level. But the second bill that I passed that passed the House and the Senate and expected to be something to go in place, my favorite bill going into this year that was attorney's fees Cost was the short title, House Bill 829. This is a very simple bill. Basically, and this is a problem in bigger cities in Florida, the 412 cities in Florida, there's a lot of big ones with a lot of money, and a lot of attorneys that kind of do whatever they want. And uh, one thing they were doing in some of these bigger cities is they're passing laws that they know the state legislature has preempted them from. So Miami uh, Beach had a minimum wage ordinance. Uh, we have a law in Florida that says local governments can have different minimum wage ordinances but they did it anyways. So basically, what my, and there's, there's a lot of examples of this, of the lawmaking at the local level that's been preempted by the state, but they do it anyways because they know that the current, the, the 
before this bill passed, the current uh, system is if you don't like that local government bill, you have to sue the local government. You have to pay your own attorney just to strike the law, even though they know it's against the state law. The state legislature hardly gets involved. You can get it, they have to sue, and then even if you lose, you still owe your attorney all this money. So long story short, I just changed the attorney's fees. So if you find the local government breaking the law, they're not following state statute, they're not following the Florida state constitution, and they're creating regulations and laws, and you decide that you're going to sue them, you're going to get your attorney's fees when you do it. So I was happy, happy to make that happen. It's going to help a lot of people who've been uh, uh, run by local government. And uh, it's, it's just pro-business, pro-consumer, pro-property rights, pro-citizen, and so that's expected to get signed. Two other bills I had just passed the House, but did not make it through the Senate. They were contentious bills, and they were lobbied hard uh, by special interests. One of them was uh, 12, House Bill 1219. It's a law, a beverage law. So basically, in Florida, if you don't know, we have this crazy thing called the three-tier system. And it, what it means is if you make alcohol, and if you sell alcohol, like distributed, or if you retail sell, like sell it in a store or a restaurant. These three different groups have to be different people. You're not allowed to actually make alcohol and distribute it and sell it. And there's slight exceptions to this in Florida law. We allow wineries to sell some of their wine on premises. We allow breweries, obviously, to do it. You go to a brewery, you know, they can tap beer, you can try there. But these are very slight exceptions. In general, we're not, we don't allow somebody to make beer to distribute it. And it's silly. So I had this very overarching bill that would have opened up the free market for craft distillers. You might know we have two craft distillers here in Lake County. We have about 40 in the state of Florida. We have some really big ones uh, along the coast, including St. Augustine Distillery, my favorite distilleries. And I just made a law that made, I proposed a law that said that these people would be able to distribute their product, they'd be able to sell more of their product in their store, uh, they'd be able to sell different types of bottles. It, it's just a very free market. Get rid of this 1930s era three-tier system strange law that we have. And uh, it turned it, uh, four different bills that failed uh, along the way got uh, amended on the mind. So it was a very large, heavy, pro-free market, anti-establishment bill because all the vested interests in, in the alcohol establishment liked the status quo. So they lobbied it and they did not pass the Senate. So I'll be following that again next year. And although that is just a niche issue, I think it speaks to the bigger issue. We just, we just need free markets here in Florida. Uh, you know, the more free market, we have the more fair competition you're going to have. I think when you have special interests fighting to create regulations that help this guy because he happens to be empowered by the status quo law, you know, doesn't help this guy who's creating the craft distillery because he wants to distribute, try to make more money, that's not good and that's not the role of government. So one of the roles I've seen myself as having up there is try to fight against these status quo special interests that exist. And then the four bill that passed the House will be re refiled again. Uh, didn't make it through the Senate this time, but I'll follow it again in two years when all the leadership changes is House Bill 1 on ethics reform. And this is a very common, practical, smart bill. It has the characteristic of all my favorite bills, which is this characteristic. When I heard about it, I said, wait, that's not the law already? It's all my favorite bills. When, you, when someone talks about it, I go, how could that not be a law? It makes so much sense. You're telling me that's not the law? Wow, I can't believe that's not the law of Florida. So, this is a bill that basically says if you're getting appropriations for somebody through the state budget as a legislator or as a city commissioner, et cetera, right, you're tied in some special interest at the locale, um, that you have to disclose it if you have a job with them or some special relationship with them. If you're getting, you know, let's say I was uh, uh, getting a bunch of uh, contracts in the state budget uh, for an entity right here in Claremont, but I had a job with them and they're paying me $100,000 and everyone knows I'm getting the money from them because they're employing me to help them out in the state legislature. Um, that should be disclosed. It should be illegal, but it, maybe, but a, a minimum should be disclosed. We should put everything in the sunshine of government. And uh, when you believe, and some people don't believe, that was a good idea. And uh, there was a lot of money spent lobbying against that. But that is a bill that I'm very passionate about. I'm, if I do eight years in the House, or two years, or four years, or whatever it be, I will file that bill. Uh, up until I leave. Like I said, I'm waiting until a full year from now because that's when the leadership changes and the current leadership will kill the bill. But that's just common sense. And there were some other really good things in there. Coincidentally, one of my favorite things in the bill uh, became my favorite thing later. So it was a minor thing. It said public officials should be able to use uh, these public service advertisements and like 
taxpayer funded uh, warnings and messages and billboards to really just promote themselves. And if anybody's been to a gas pump lately, you'll probably notice that the politician, our state ag commissioner of agriculture, who, you know, it's not personal at all, but I don't believe anybody in that position should be able to put a sticker on every gas pump in the state of Florida with their smiling face, <laughs> her name, and everything else. So this bill, actually, which was filed before that whole fiasco happened, would have made that illegal. It just makes sense. I mean, why would we allow government officials to take our taxpayer money to promote themselves? Um, I just don't believe that that should be the case. So, uh, in terms of appropriations, you can that up in the state budget. Um, there was a newspaper article that said a bunch of Lake County people, the legislators didn't get anything for the county or didn't get anything passed. Uh, they, I think they still don't understand how to read the budget. I'm not saying it's easy to read the budget, but you got to learn how to read the budget to realize what kind of appropriations the uh, different representatives of the Senate are able to get back for their uh, community. So I was happy to get $250,000 for Lifestream Behavioral Health Center. So that's our mental health center that helps uh, usually people in need. And so in this case, the money was going to people who were being banker active, so involuntarily, simply combined, usually dangerous people, get them off the streets, get them help. So we got a quarter million dollars for that. We got a quarter million dollars for Special Olympics, which actually is based right here in Claremont. A lot of people don't know that. It's right off Highway 50. It's about a mile from here. Special Olympics Florida is based here in Claremont. So this money goes to children with special needs that uh, want to participate in athletic programs. And I've been to a lot of their events, and I can tell you the money is very wisely and very well used. So happy to bring that project back. $100,000 for Lake Sumter State College for security improvements. Uh, it's an old campus. They uh, are not able with their current budget to keep up with uh, the amount of funding uh, that they need to secure their campus in these times where a mass shooter is obviously a distinct possibility. And uh, got 100000 for that. And then 50000 for LRMC, Leesburg Regional Medical Center, so they can do an exploratory program to bring graduate students into the community. What we need is good, young doctors. It's hard to get them to come to Lake County. I love Lake County. But because a lot of times these doctors are going from larger cities, they're looking at bigger hospitals and more urban areas, and they're not as, as attractive to uh, hospitals in Lake County. So this is a, a program that's going to bring in some of those doctors, help our hospitals, uh, better services, and of course bring great people in the county who are going to best buy homes and just make it a better place. So uh, next year, I'm hoping to get a lot more projects done, but that's it for now. Oh, and then as a team, our, uh, our representatives, uh, put in a project for Elevate Lake, a half million dollars at Eustis High School, but it's a program for the whole county because they have the house on somewhere so they're doing it at Eustis. But it's a vocational program for students to be able to come to that high school and take an enormous amount of vocational classes, HVAC, carpentry, all different types of things uh, that will teach them vocational schools before they get out. And parallel with this was a good policy bill we passed this year that creates a new high school degree, which if they get 18 credits, uh, well actually let me rephrase it. So the way it works is if you go into high school, uh, we made a, a mandatory thing that you have to do career planning in middle school now. So you got to sit down with your counselor in middle school and then ask them, uh, you know, talk to them about what it is that you're interested in. And if you're legitimately interested in vocational education, which a lot of people, a lot of students are at that young age, they will go into high school on a vocational track and they'll get 18 credits of vocational training. So like my good buddy Mark Gensel from high school, they'll get a welding degree by the time they get out of high school and make $20, $25 an hour while everybody else is still trying to figure out what they're going to do that summer. Uh, and a bit of these days, well, they're making obviously a lot more than that if you read the news. So long story short, I kind of went all over the place, talked a little bit about higher education. Um, let me talk about a few other high profile bills that passed this year. One of my favorite bills. Senate Bill 168, what they call the Sanctuary City Bill. So this is one of my favorite bills. I think it's a common sense bipartisan bill. It became very partisan, but all it basically says is when local governments get a detainer request from the federal government, so the federal government comes to them and says, hey, we have a proven criminal, criminal, illegal alien in your vicinity or in your jail or in your custody, will you please help us with transferring that person over? This made it the law that all local governments in the state of Florida will have to work with ICE or any federal government entity to detain and remove those criminal illegal aliens. And I think it's common sense and it's a great idea and it basically creates a, a policy that no sanctuary cities or counties would be created in the state of Florida, of which there's a risk for that in some of the more liberal cities and counties in the state of Florida. So happy to see that bill passed. 
Um, any questions? Just kind of a rough overview. I'd love to do more Q and A, but I figure I'd start with a big comprehensive kind of uh, run. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a question about um, uh, health care reform. Yes, sir. Uh, making uh, more affordable, non-comprehensive health care plans. The key word there is comprehensive. It's like, I mean, how many people in this room have planned um, and to have an injury? Like next Tuesday, I'm going to have an injury, or I'm going to get sick. I'm going to need a certain particular type of coverage. When you have these non-comprehensive coverages, then it's likely that when you do need health care, the plan you selected, and although it was cheap and you saved a few bucks here and there, then you're going to get saddled with a considerably large you know, hospital bill, possibly you know, surgery bill, and whatnot. And whereas you can't forecast what kind of health care you're going to need, no one can and that by offering these, these non-comprehensive bills, uh, uh, plans, it's like people are obviously you're going to pick what's cheap and you're going to be able to say you're covered by health care. But it's really just this roll of the dice, you don't know. And, 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 just, and to me, it's, it seems irresponsible to portray that, oh, everyone gets to pick when really they're going to pick whatever's cheap and not understand the consequences of the decision. I think you bring up a, a great concern, which is we have products, healthcare plans uh, available on the market that aren't going to get the job done. And I'm not on the healthcare committees right now. It's been sort of a specialty of the House. So some of the senior members are the ones on them, and they're the ones kind of taking up the, uh, the, uh, the particular bills. I didn't see that many bills proposed that speak particularly to the issue of what can be offered for a healthcare plan this year. It really had to do with more global delivery of the healthcare item. Uh, but I think that's a, a serious issue. We need to make sure we don't have junk plans going out there because we're all going to pick up the cost for those, those <coughs> procedures as taxpayers. And I think, uh, you know, maybe I didn't hit it enough, but the House is extremely attuned to that, and they want to make sure that we keep cost of health care delivery at the lowest possible point for everyone. So I'm looking forward to seeing what gets proposed in that arena. I don't have a particular idea or plan. Yeah, but if you have some ideas or you've seen something proposed in the state or something talked about that uh, you think would work well, uh, I would definitely encourage you to give me a call or my staff and maybe I'll follow up. I mean, I'm, I'm all about experimentation and innovation and looking at what new law or regulation we can to make to innovate the healthcare marketplace, but I'm not sure. Don't, different question or don't be a dovetail? Different question. Okay, cool. So, uh, you know, then, uh, yeah, so please reach out to me about in terms of Managing what's being offered right now, uh, I'm not 100 percent sure. You know what what good ideas out there right now. I mean, they only passed about 195 bills this year, uh, but I don't think any had that specific. They weren't really about that specific problem. But please come talk to me. We'll, we'll figure something out. I'd be interested in possibly. Yes, sir. Um, philosophical question. Several of the bills that you sponsored or supported involved restrictions on local government. Yep. And in things like sanctuary cities, I can definitely see that, and I appreciate it, because that affects everybody in a big way. There's also a conservative principle that says the government that governs best is the closest to the people. If my city messes up, I can call my mayor, I can get an appointment with the city manager. If the governor or Washington does, I have very little redress. I can't get an appointment with the governor. So how do you feel about that? Where's the line between let the look if they if in my answer they want to elect some crazy people to do crazy things for them. Why do we care? Um, and, and it just seems sure. like a balance. Oh, that's great. And you're yeah. back in here because I'm ready for this. So I, I talk about this all the time. So you name one of my highest philosophical principles. In my case, it's probably my second highest. The government closest to the people is the one that should be governing on whatever issue is necessary to be governed by government to be dealt with by government. In my case, most issues are not supposed to get government solutions. They're supposed to happen in the free marketplace. Let citizens or business or just the private sphere handle that issue. Government steps in when it must. Policing, fire, streets, that sort of thing. So it's the second highest principle. The first one is the government which governs best, governs least. Right? So I look at, I mean, I'm just giving you my philosophical, some philosophical questions so I can do a philosophical answer. I look at an issue and I say, you know, how can government stay out of this unless it should, unless it really need to be in there? Because in my particular perspective, government usually messes things up when it gets too involved and sticks its fingers in. Uh, and it, it has a history of competing on rights 
and, uh, and uh, liberty. So then I go to the next one. So, so first of all, should the government be regulating that thing at all? Answer in most cases is no. I think when it comes to local government, because local government is completely, totally ballooned over the last few decades to the point where they want to regulate everything, including front yard carrots. Um, but I believe that once you've made that decision, then you go and you say to the, you know, the next question is, hey, should, should the state be handling this or not? And when you hear about this, the state government is moving in and eclipsing home rule or messing with local rule, we're almost never adding a regulation or a tax or directing or commandeering local government to do something. Most of the time what we're doing is we're, we're saying no one shall govern in that area, not even the local government. And the truth of the matter is we should have the appropriate role to do that. In fact, I think we have the duty to do that. The reason is nearly all 412 cities and nearly all 67 counties in Florida were created by the legislature. In fact, it only takes a general act, a general bill, literally one bill I could file. If it passes both houses and gets out of the governor, I could dissolve, the legislature could dissolve any city or county. So we've created these local government uh, entities. I don't look at them as truly democratic and a reflection of the people. Why? Because, let's be honest, most of them were created in the 19th century. They were used for bonding. People created the local government so they could flow bonds to get the wastewater plant. These very simple utilities put into place. And then everybody moved to Florida, and guess what? Now we're stuck in this local government or county. And it, it, it's kind of outlived its purpose. Sure, we still want them to do this for AIDS. We want the water, the wastewater, the police, the fire. But we don't want them telling us that we can't have carrots. And we don't want them to have this bloated uh, corpus of individuals like the city of Eustis, which has 260 employees. Uh, and the average employee is making twice what the person in the private sector is making in that very same area. So local government really is at, uh, just ballooned itself and it really needs to just get out of the way and let the free market thing dictate. And that's my philosophical approach. I think, and when I talk to voters, I think voters really want less government. Uh, I think local government provides them more issues than, than not. And so that's the philosophical approach I take. Sorry to give such a long long answer, Jimmy. Yes, sir. So you said the Florida State passed a law to allow, or you said it was up to the school board, but to allow for teachers to get paid and get funding for training to house firearms on school campuses. But was any more funding directed to increasing resource officers, or we only have one for like three high schools and a 10 mile radius, and like an actual counselor, not a guidance counselor that tells you what classes to take, but an actual like free counselor. Now, has any more funding gone to that? So local government handles, local school boards handle the hiring and training of, of police officers at the local level. And although last year there was a lot of funding for that, I don't think this year they get extra money at the state level to hire local police. But it's up to the local governments and school boards to do that themselves, and they do have the money to do it. Most can, most counties, they hire an enormous amount of resource officers. Uh, I would remind you, though, that it was a resource officer that responded in the case of Parkland. So I try to keep people open-minded in the fact that we don't, school resource officers aren't always going to be the solution to every mass shooting problem. Uh, that solution gave us a bad result in the case of Parkland. So I try to keep people open-minded, the fact that there's an enormous amount of veterans and people who are familiar with uh, firearms, a lot of times people who might even have a background in law enforcement in the school systems already, in the school boards, and those people themselves can be school resource officers. Uh, and so that's a cheaper, great alternative. Uh, but here in Lake County, obviously, we have a lot of school uh, resource officers at the, uh, uh, at the local level, and I think it's a model program that the school board in Lake County has created for other counties to follow. But I don't, once again, I don't think it's the state's role to provide a bunch of money for them to hire the public. Well, they already have enormous bonding power. They have enormous tax power, uh, amount of money, $700 million, I believe, is the school board term, uh, school board budget here in Lake County. And so uh, it, it's, it's an important need, so they should refocus the budget on the hiring of those officers. Yes, sir? This kind of touches on the uh, Stoneman Act um, that you just spoke of. This question is uh, from one of my friends. I'm going to read it in his direct words. If you want to speak up, I don't know if these folks over here can hear you. Dear Mr. Sabatini, unfortunately I had a prior engagement tomorrow evening and will not be able to attend the town hall scheduled for June 17th. As a constituent in District 32, I would, however, request the following be addressed during the meeting. On January 7, 2019, you co-sponsored House Bill 175 with Representative Mike Hill. 
which would restore firearms purchase rights to law-abiding citizens that were stripped by the Major, Major Stoneman Act of uh, 2018. The bill, however, was withdrawn prior to introduction on February 25th, 2019. A substantially similar bill, House Bill 6073, was later filed by Representative Hill on March 5th, 2019. The bill, however, lacked your co-sponsorship. Prior to your last legislative session, you campaigned that you will always fight, for, fight to protect the right and keep and bear arms. As I am an adamant supporter of the Second Amendment and our fundamental rights, my questions are therefore, why was House Bill 175 withdrawn after induction? Why did you not co-sponsor House Bill 6073? If there were specific provisions, what were they? Will you be filing a firearm rights bill next legislative session that restores the firearm purchase rights of 18 to 21 year olds? Thank you so much for the question. So just a little background so you guys understand what the question is. Uh, last year, after the tragedy at Parkland, part of the overarching answer to the issue of how to prevent these shootings in the future was were elements of gun control. Uh, although the great majority of the bill I agree with, I don't believe that the gun control had any factual or evidentiary relation to preventing gun crimes. For example, telling a student, or not a student, 19, 20, 18, 19, or 20 year old person who has never committed a felony or anything that they can't purchase a shotgun, which is the current law for it, uh, has no relation to preventing these, these, these crimes. In fact, most of these laws are being skirted and ignored with to begin with by the Massachusetts. It doesn't make sense to, to create these new regulations that are never going to be ignored anyway, especially with the black market that exists in the world. So uh, uh, I campaigned, as many Republicans did, that when I got to Tallahassee, I would fight to repeal them, either sponsor or co-sponsor the bill. And a panhandle Republican, uh, who was a friend of mine, filed a bill to repeal it. I co-sponsored it. The leadership of the House who created the regulations last year didn't like it because they obviously made the law. It was too contentious of vote. They just wanted time to pass before they even reconsidered it as a topic. Uh, basically refused to hear the bill. So the repeal of the gun control measures in the, in the 7068 Marjorie Stoneman Act bill weren't even heard. And I believe, I, I've never heard from the horse's mouth, that the leadership in the House told that representative who filed it, and I was one of the co-sponsors, I think I was the only co-sponsor, the co actually, uh, that they weren't going to hear it, so he might as well call it. If he did, he could put it on the bill in his place and try to get something done. But if he did it, it was just going to die. So I believe he pulled it, and then, and then he, without telling me, he refiled the bill in the last week of committees as a repealer, which you have unlimited of. You can do unlimited repeal bills. Because the way he actually had the bill designed the first time, it was a substantive bill, it had extra language in there. So he never told me he refiled it, so I never had a chance to send a co-sponsorship request for that bill. And of course, that bill, which is identical, nearly identical to the first one, never got heard either. So either me or him or another conservative Republican We'll file that bill and co-sponsor that bill again. And I will co-sponsor it uh, every year I'm in the House. And I do actually am optimistic that people will have an intelligible conversation about what we can do to prevent mass shootings in Florida and be prepared for them when they happen. But I don't believe that stripping normal citizens who don't break laws of their constitutional rights has any relation to it. You see all this gun crime in some of the bluest states with the strictest gun control. And uh, I think people should really stop, take a breath, look at the facts and evidence and realize that these gun, gun laws actually don't prevent the shootings. But thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, no, because if you do, then you can't pay women more than men, right? So the law basically says you have to treat them exactly equal. Yeah. No, I, guess I, I somebody said that to me once and I was like, wait a minute, so this law, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So, so the law basically says women and men, in general, you know, it's a constitutional amendment, it's broadly defined, they'll have enabling statutes, making it that men wouldn't have to be treated equally. Obviously, they should so be treated equally. you're looking out for my best interest. Well, let me, let me finish this. So they should be treated equally. That's awesome. Well, you, you know, it's just, a, it, I don't think we disagree on where we want to go. It's, should, is government the solution? Obviously, it is. the government is the solution. Yeah, so history is not with you on that, but uh, I don't think... Government does offer many solutions to 
offers more problems than solutions. But the ERA amendment, if enacted, would make it illegal, actually, to, to pay women more than men, which I think that day is coming. Uh, yeah, that women, because they're, they're more prone to seeking education, higher education opportunities, that's an actual trend in society currently. They will be getting paid more. They will be getting more opportunities. They will be in more positions of power. They'll, they'll, they'll and the bill, and part. the bill will actually make it that those women will not be able to get paid I'll, I'll more. I'll take my chances. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm describing a trend in society that is obviously occurring. Uh, I want to dovetail on some earlier questions. I want to. I think it was yours. I'm, I'm, I think it was Sal. Sal, I just you asked you. Yes, ma'am. When he was talking about the expansion of the guardianship. Sorry, I have a mind. Do you want the mind? No, thank you. He was talking about the, guardian, the expansion of the guardianship program, where yes, there was um, monies set aside by the state given to the school boards who did the, choose to do the guardian program yes, for the training of teachers. But he was asking, I believe, what other parts were there? Were there added monies for things that weren't just training and buying weapons for the teachers, but actually things like, like you said, resource officers or guidance counselors, which I know we don't have as much of. Is that correct? Not guidance on brief, right. so they're, they're slightly different. So there's only one for, there's a singular person who would have to deal with if we were to have a mass shooting or we had several suicides mm -hmm. at Lake Mineola. I think there's about three in the course of what, right. two months. And then there was another two this year at South Lake. So it's also suicide, also a problem. So right. that's why we need that brief counselor should be tied in, but they're different than guidance counselors. Right. Guidance yeah. counselors don't right. really tell us much more than. So I think he's asking, was there extra money put into that guardianship program for those services, or is it only tied to Last well, year there was, and I do apologize, I don't have the exact answer for this year's budget. I can't quite remember if there were additional funds included. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that does, but if you come see me or my staff right after this, we'll get you the answer. And if, it's, and if the answer is yes, then I'll get you the exact number. I, but I don't think we have it this year. I do, I do encourage you to sit down and read your school board budget, though. Because I think what you'll find is that, the, just like we found when we changed the superintendents of Lake County, there's a lot of weight at the top, and there's a lot of new monies that can be used in priorities like guidance counselors and school resource officers that may not be being used in that regard. And I think the change in the school board was, if you read those news articles and you read what happened and the way they actually changed their budget, you'll see that sometimes money in government just appears. So please take a look at that. But my other question Yes, yes, the yes, first question was we were talking about uh, creating competition for the health care and, 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 you know, you obviously you're looking at removing barriers, market barriers, um, so that people can shop around. The problem is for hospitals, as you use an example, when they have basically a, what they call like the, the cost Bible, right? Not every hospital has the same cost for every service. They don't always have it listed out where you can have it. If you want to call up and say, hey, I think I might need to uh, schedule my C-section. Can you give me the cost of that? No one can tell you because there is, they don't have a, they, I know that just recently they say they have to, but it doesn't have to be comprehensive. They can just hand it to you. They don't have to tell you every single thing that you're going to need during that surgery. And so you have actually no idea of the cost. So all I see right now is that you guys are, saying that you're going to get rid of barriers to open all these new things, but you're not actually making it for the consumer to be able to actually assess cost and do that. So, like, even with the hospitals, if they don't do that, there's no penalty for them right so, now when they don't do that. I agree with you. Let me back up though, just for a second. First of all, it's not that they can't do it. It's just that they won't do it. Right. Hospitals never had an incentive to do it. And when they were forced by the Trump administration through DHS to actually create uh, a sheet that showed the cost of all these goods all over um, the country and from the state of Florida, it was unintelligible. You can right. read it, I can't remember the exact law, but you can read it, they printed out this document, and you literally had no idea. The nomenclature for each procedure, let's say it was right. tendonitis, but you, you had no idea what it said, and it, it was remarkably dense and, and un, unattainable. The state of Florida has created, actually, under Prince Scott, one of his priorities four years ago, I believe a website that creates a, a list of all those procedures, which right now under ACA, under the State Healthcare Agency, you can go online and find, and it just has been advertised, the average cost of all of those procedures in the state of Florida and the various different hospitals. Last year, this year, the legislature has made it a priority to up that 
uh, website, to provide more funding to make it better, to make it more competitive. And part of the Patient Safety Act is that, to making it attainable for people to choose the procedure they want. I mean, I think somebody, somebody mentioned earlier, obviously you're not going to choose what hospital you're going when you get into a car accident, but a majority of the, of the procedures that hospital, of the funds hospitals are taking in for money, still comes from standardized pre-planned procedures. Right. Not just the ER, although there's a lot of money in that. Money's really specialized size is the new trend of where the money's coming from. So the state is doing everything it can to make sure that all of these different health healthcare entities comply and that the information's uh, accessible. And you reminded me because I need to really nail the piece of legislation that was on that topic this year. Please come see us after this and I'll, I'll get you squared away on that. Make a note of that because it, like I said, I was on the health care committee, so I'm familiar with it. I read into it, but it's kind of in the back of my mind right now. So but thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the First Amendment uh, gives us five rights, and one of them is the right to petition. Yes, ma'am. And uh, DeSantis recently signed a bill that limits our right to petition because it limits us to get the signatures to the um, supervisor of elections within 30 days. Therefore, it is limiting our rights as free speech. Um, what is your opinion of this bill that was signed by Governor DeSantis? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, House Bill 5, one of my favorite bills, actually. It, first of all, let me just speak broadly about what the bill does. The bill only regulates Floridians. It made it illegal for out-of-state folks to come petition. Floridians can get as many petitions as they want. They can petition grievances as no, the First but Amendment. They have to have those petitions in within 30 yeah, days. I'll get to that. I'm gonna, okay. I'll go through the bill. So it, it allows all Floridians to do that. The, the ostensible purpose of this bill is to make sure that an out of state billionaire can't just pour literally 50, 60 million dollars in the state of Florida, buy a bunch of people to just get the petitions, put it in, in confusing language on the ballot, and then change the process of lawmaking in the state of Florida, which has happened in the past. So basically, if you made some very common sense regulations, you might have a, a respectable disagreement about these regulations. I happen to think they were good. Uh, basically says, once you get these petitions, turn them in within 30 days. So, so you're getting them, you're just not going to sit on them. I mean, I, I really don't see the harm in that. One says that when you pay people to do this, uh, you can't just buy them per, per the petition, because you create this perverse incentive for the person to just get as many petitions as they possibly can, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, doing it because they believe in the thing. A lot of times you go to these concerts and stuff, the people getting these petitions have no idea what it's about. They don't never read the form of the Constitution. They're only getting this because they're making money. So someone's essentially purchasing the change in the Constitution. And finally, it makes it that these people have to register with the state, right? These are agents of change who are literally trying to change our state Constitution. We should know who they are. So this basically says you have to say who you are. And if you don't register, it's a misdemeanor. Register, get paid, you can still do it by the hour, you just can't do it per, and then you can't sit on hundreds or thousands of bundles of these things, because then, you know, I think that lends itself to abuse. Maybe somebody's messing with them. Maybe they're adding information on them. Uh, just turn them in. So, so, so you agree that it's okay to limit the First Amendment rights? So, just so you know, <laughs> all, all five the rights of the First Amendment. Which I appreciate you knowing. A lot of people don't know that. As my intern, if I had one of my interns here, I would say, I want to write the First Amendment. One, no, fine. Um, I tell them that every First Amendment, every right is limited. We put common sense regulations on rights all the time. You can't spread fire in, in, a, in a theater, that sort of thing. And so I, I'm a firm believer in the Constitution. I like broadly defined uh, uh, First Amendment rights. But I do believe that when we're talking about billionaires coming in and purchasing, no, no, I'm just well, talking about, I'm not talking about people pay. I'm just talking about anybody who does this as a volunteer. They still have to get those petitions in in 30 days. So, therefore, that is limiting What's the their problem? right. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with 30 some days? common sense limitations and regulations on the process. Thank you. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Well, when folks were asking about the funding for um, the Guardian program or other safety issues, we also need to remember that the voters in Lake County exactly. voted a 0.75 mil property tax. I should have, yeah, I try to keep and, the answer more state based right. on what we're doing, right. but just a supplementary fact, Marie has a great concern for, for the, our young students in the back. Uh, 
in case you didn't know, because you brought in vote in last election, we passed because we give that authority to local governments to do what they wish. Uh, a very robust tax increase here in Lake County, used particularly for school security. I think it's an eight-year tax, uh, six or eight years. Four. four. Okay, maybe four years. And it's 0.75 mills, which, you know, $100,000 house, or $150,000 house, and for homestead exemption, you know, you're paying, you know, what is it? Everybody's paying 75 bucks, every house in the whole county, right? 345,000 people in this county. And that's also on the commercial property, too. So, you know, the mall, or, you know, commercial property, all these big commercial properties that people are paying a lot. And I think it's all so listed the, on the website, everything they're spending the money. So, and like only a percentage of that's based on hardening schools, like bulletproof glass or whatever. Most of it's being spent on training and resource officers and that sort of thing. So once again, you know, we, that's the, the legislature never gets credit, but we allow them to do that. We allow tax increases to take place at the local level when the voters decide. And that was like 67% of Lake County voted for that. So. I did find an answer to help clarify on Senate Bill 7030. The bill increases student access to mental, health, mental and behavioral interventions by providing funding for school-based mental health personnel and services and provides time frames for referral and beginning of services. So hopefully that kind of, I don't have an exact dollar amount, but hopefully that clarifies. Uh, from the meeting that I was about a month ago, the superintendent, they do over the course of Yes, Mike. Um, Representative, do you have a feel for what the priority of the leadership is for the, uh, for the governor for next year? Is it early? Uh, the House will be exactly the same. You'll see uh, 10 or 12 major bills that change the delivery of health care reform in Florida. I think probably the number one or number two bill will be the nurse practitioner bill. So if you're a nurse or know anyone that's a nurse, it's a very good bill for you. It's a bill that says skilled nurses, skilled nurse practitioners, and different types of uh, uh, nurses, uh, anesthetists, that sort of thing, will be able to practice independently of doctors, which will really reduce the cost of health care uh, in the state of Florida and a lot of procedures and operations. So uh, they've been able to practice to the extent they're training in other states. Uh, dental hygienists, same thing. There's certain types of dental, dental hygienists uh, what they call dental therapists, they're hygienists who are more trained that can do things dentists can without the regulation. And so, once again, special interests are going to fight that bill because the doctors are a powerful lobby, the Florida Medical Association is a very powerful lobby. They don't want that free market. They want to keep it that, you know, you're not a doctor, you're not going to be able to do this, but the, health, the House is going to continue to move forward pushing those priorities of delivering the health care delivery system the best we can. I can almost guarantee the governor is going to do the same thing with the, the, the environment. He's going to want another six or seven hundred million dollar uh, massive environmental funding. Hopefully, more inland this time. A lot of times it was coastal and everything's focused. I want to get some money over here to Lake Apopka and for the St. John's region and Oaxaca Basin. That's going to be my goal next year. And then the Senate this year, their big thing was the toll road. They create toll roads in the rural parts of the state that could increase economic development. I don't know what else they have planned. Usually the Senate just kind of tries to moderate everything that's happening. Uh, I'm sure they'll do that again. But uh, as importantly, uh, the toll roads, that was a 10, 20 year project. So they're going to just try to fight to continue or increase the funding that they've already committed the state to this year. As soon as they leave, you know, the legislature can change their mind on that whole project. So they have to stick, it, stick their feet in the ground, make sure that that doesn't happen. That doesn't change. Your committee assignments change next year or you're on the same committee? Uh, there's very minor tweaks. You'll see, you know, some people move around and some people leave the House of Representatives and run for different offices, but I plan on being with these same communities next year. I hope I am. Yes, sir. Um, with the ability to only put through six proposed bills, why spend so much political capital on the straw issue? Was it a local issue that I'm not aware about? Um, I just, I think that bill was a waste, and you could have done something specifically to target the problem here locally. Yeah. So it looks like there's a very limited amount of space for bills, and there's only so you know there's so many issues we can tackle in Florida. The truth of the matter is, there's 120 reps, each gets six bills, so that's 720, right? 
uh, just policy bills alone, and the Senate gets unlimited. So they're, all those 720 or whatever are going to get matched, matched in the Senate immediately. Uh, and there's going to be extra bills that pile up on top of that. They're called PCBs, Proposed Committee Bills. So they're bills that generate out of the committee. They're, they're not limited. They can make a limit of those half of the bills that came out of the committees themselves. So we're talking eight, nine, hundred bills. So with the straw bill, you know, by the time I hit four or five bills, it gets down to the point where you've got usually one extra bill slot. And yeah, if I had another idea, I would have done another idea. But uh, one bill that I filed this year that he uh, had a question about and concerns about is a bill that I think made a, at least made a principal point, which is that local governments should focus on local government, governing the things that are in their areas of, of uh, the, the, the citizens trust and want them to govern in, which is fixing streets, hiring police and firefighters, and you know running the school system, that sort of thing. And local governments, because you know they obviously react to the media and the body politic in a, a very sensitive way, create all these straw bans, these bans that say, oh, a fish died out in the ocean, so we're going to ban all the plastic straws in our city. We're counting because we think that some we don't trust them to throw the straw in the trash can. They're going to go throw in the ocean and kill hundreds or thousands or millions of fish. And it didn't make any sense, and it was totally out of whack. And so to make a point, I called a bill that got rid of all the straw, uh, uh, all the straw bans in Florida. So that way we can re-gear, refocus what local government's doing on important issues, not to dismiss environmental issues. But banning straws actually has nothing to do with environmental issues. If there was a Venn diagram and these are the straw bands and this is the environment stuff, there's no overlap. Uh, it's just pure virtue signaling and it's to appease people in the media uh, who actually don't care about the environment. They just want something that's controversial to talk about. So, uh, I mean, yeah, if there was a better idea, I would have done that instead of the straw bell. And three or four people filed that straw bell, which I did not expect. And the guy who was on, put it into the environmental package and passed it was vetoed by the governor. Uh, probably did not expect that to happen. So, long story short, I look at all the different bills I can file, and I try to find out which ones are going to move, and that one had a Senate sponsor that was definitely moving, so I filed it. Uh, but if there's a better bill, come see me, I'll, I'll file it. Yeah, for next year, let's, uh, I don't know if they had anything this past year, but definitely one that would address occupation licensing. That would be awesome. So there's a massive bill, I think it was House Bill uh, 27. Uh, it was a big, what they call a DREG bill, the regulation bill, a bill that would have knocked out all different types of regulations uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, there's all types of regulations. To be an auctioneer, you have to get a license. To be a geologist, there's all types of crazy weird licenses. That makes sense. Right now, it's like a misdemeanor to practice as an interior designer without a license. All the, no, I'm not talking about like an engineer, I'm talking about just the guy putting the curtains up, etc. There's all different types of regulations. Barbers, you need, I think, 2,000 hours to be a barber. My yeah. barber doesn't. I think that's a good idea. I think it's right here in Claremont. Uh, all these different regulations, and, and this was a big DREG bill, passed the House, we were all happy about it, and the Senate killed it. Why? Because special interests uh, lobbied the Senate, said that all, all those occupations need to be uh, uh, policed and, and licensed and regulated, and of course, there's no evidence for that. There's no facts or evidence to show that those things would be hazardous or bad for if we agree be regulated. But, you know, they listen to the special interest and they kill the bill. So it'll be filed next year. Again, it's been filed every year for three years. And I think eventually it'll pass, but not this year. Yes, sir. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of pressure in Florida for public you know, buying public lands, both at the state level and then even here in the county. They spent $35 million to buy them. But they never budget for maintenance or making the lands accessible. And so just this morning I read that uh, under... Uh, President Trump, the federal government now is expanding the ability to hunt and fish. They've reduced something like 7,000 regulations with all these, you know, no access rules because if it's public land, the public should be able to access it. So the issue is that here in Lake County, they got those public lands, plus you've got others. You've got the Lake County Water Authority. You've got uh, St. John's River Water Management District. They've got public lands, and yet there's no access by the public to them because those agencies don't have the money for putting in parking, for putting in porta potties. And so you go by them, and it says uh, restricted, no access. Do you see that there's any movement to force 
the ability to provide access to all those public lands. That's a great concern and issue. I think it's something that takes a step-by-step uh, -step approach. I don't know if we can do a blanket rule like they do at the federal level, obviously at the Department of Interior, where you can just make a rule like that. Different agencies that know different things. It's a serious concern. We spent over $34 million this year in Florida acquiring land. So $34 million went into the Forever Florida program. I think generally it's a good program, but we can't buy up the whole state. We just got to preserve things that are important, like the green swamp, actually sensitive, protected, important pieces of land, make sure those things are protected. Um, so it's just it's a valid concern. I mean, let's talk about that specifically about what should be opened up for it. As a conservative, I think a common sense person, I think any public land should be opened up to public access and passive use. So you said hunting. I mean, obviously we should be able to allow hunting on some of these public lands if that's accessible uh, it makes sense. And so, yeah, I think there's like agency protectionism that exists, but, you know, we have to specifically talk about the, the, the one piece of property that we can do that on. I mean, um, I know a lot of these wildlife management areas in Florida are open to public hunting and camping and that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, philosophically I agree with you, but we have to talk about the specific piece of land because I'm not familiar with one at, at the time that uh, is an issue, especially here in Lake County. I think most people are kind of happy about that. But yeah, we'll talk to the Water Authority and get them squared away. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. To touch on the toll roads, um, I know they got passed and it's the start of it to, to, from my understanding, to start purchasing that land. What concern, have the concerns been looked at that that is literally one of the last old Florida parks and by putting toll roads like the Turnpike and the Suncoast Expressway up through Apalachicola and Cedar Key, that in turn is going to destroy that area. There is not going to be a piece of old Florida left. What's being done to secure and, and save those kind of areas? Sure. Good question. Great concern. Uh, I trust the people who worked on the bill. Uh, that a lot of them are from the Panhandle including the bill sponsor. Well, they want quicker access, so it's clear that they would want that because they can cut three miles or three hours well, off the drive. Well, let me say something about the bill. So the bill includes, I don't know the specific language, a task force, a group that does environmental studies along the way. So we're, we're five, six years away from them really breaking ground. Everything's done in the preliminary study and the study, environmental study, of which will all be open to the public. Public comment can be changed at any given time not just like, okay, we're building this road here tomorrow. Um, I encourage everyone to stay as publicly involved as they possibly can. My goal is that hopefully we can provide the oversight, me, you, and everybody else, to make sure those projects are handled like the Wakaiva River uh, project was. I think the uh, Central Florida Expressway, when it came to dealing with Wakaiva River and the Wakaiva River Basin was done expertly, and they protected the environment in the sensitive areas of Florida in a way that kept Residents happy, tourists happy, people in the rear area happy, the environment happy, and of course business interests who want to open up, buy land, build Florida, create growth, etc. Uh, that's what most people like. So that's what it should be, uh, uh, I think, trained on, and hopefully we can make that happen, make sure that it's environmentally sensitive. But it's open to public comments, open to public concern, and I think the environmental factor that the governor has in his sort of public face and agenda will lead him and the state legislature to make sure that when it's done, it's not doing it in such a way that hurts the environment. There's already stipulations in the bill about removing endangered uh, tortoises and all that. It's all been debated in the House floor. You could watch the debate on the House floor. The Florida Channel went on for quite a while uh, talking about it. So I think in, in built in the bill without being an expert on it uh, is a lot of things that really prevent uh, the degradation of our environment in Florida. And, uh, you know, we Republicans are pro-growth, but we do want Florida to be Florida. We grew up here. We love it. We don't want it to change. We don't want to destroy the Apalachicola Bay. We don't want to destroy the, uh, the you know, unique environment of Florida. So hopefully that we can get that done with this package. I think there's two ways you can go, the good way or the bad way. It's just to take, take some public involvement. Yes, sir. I'd like to get an understanding of why you are such a big supporter bringing the Kirby Smith statue to Lake County, considering that A, he has nothing to do with Lake County. B, St. Augustine, where he's from, has nothing to do with him. C, 
see if it's under the consideration of it being a civil war uh, in Mandela. The Lake County Historical Society is not a civil war museum, although there is a wing in Tallahassee, the Florida Museum. Also, I believe there's also a, uh, a specific civil war museum, I believe it's in Atlanta. Why not send it either to Tallahassee or Atlanta, where it belongs, and not here? And further inflaming all the other issues that have been brought up, uh, a la Sheriff McCall and his ilk in the history of Lake County. Okay, so here, thank you for the question. It's a long question. It's an important question, though, for some. So, my first perspective on this whole entire issue is <laughs> I can't believe I have to defend this, but I, I, apparently I do. If it's a museum, if it's a historical museum, there's the, the burden is enormously on the person that's trying to censor the museum, right? So technically, me or anybody else involved in that museum or living here in the county shouldn't have to defend the, the occupancy of a statue in a historical museum. If that's where we are today, that's extremely frightening, it's extremely scary, because you're leading us, that logic that I think you've demonstrated, is leading us to the point where histories are going to have to defend everything within their museums. And if it offends somebody in the public, the knee-jerk reaction by some is to actually remove or censor or displace items from within the museum. I'm a history, I was a history major at the University of Florida. I love history, I have a passion for history. I think my sense of patriotism and identity as an American is informed by history. I think Americans' history will form them. I'm proud of American history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I like where it got us. I like where we are today. So when I look at a history museum, I don't want it to just highlight pieces that I like. I want it to highlight all of it. And so that's a museum based on Lake County history, which is Florida history, which is Southern history. And so, oh, I, I, I got you. Well, this is more the Southern history, and it doesn't really tie to it, 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 First of all, this isn't legislative town hall, but uh, because you're here, I respect your opinion. I'm engaging you in the honest. It has nothing to do with this. This I can spend days with. Yeah, 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 but so 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 I I'm always going to be against the person that's trying to censor a history museum because I want my kids and grandkids to grow up, go to a museum, and see it. Do we really think that someone's going to see a Kirby Smith statue and really think that that's an element of glorification? No, they're going to see it as a historically contextualized object from a far gone period from which we can learn and neutrally view and then observe and then cast our own judgments on. And I, I'm, I'm almost fairly confident that everyone in this room will look at the statue or look at the Civil War and come to the same conclusion, which is that they're glad that it had the result that it did and we got to where we are and then we moved past it. Uh, and that's really the entire reason they want to display the history because historical objects bring history to life. They see it, it makes history come more alive, and then they, they move on. But I'm, I'm always going to be against censorship. Why does he have to do with Lake County? Uh, so he's a important historical southern general in Florida, which I believe is the third state so to so see. Lake County was founded. County. So Lake County was actually founded and largely built by people involved in the Civil War, Civil yes. War officers enlisted. And so I think there's actually all types of connections there. Uh, but obviously I'm not here to defend the exact reason why. Once again, you, I just want to say one thing about the nature of the question. I don't believe we should be looking at museums and saying, and asking historical boards or proponents of historic museums or residents in there to defend why historic objects in the museum. I think we should, the person defending themselves should be the radical left, like more rich, who are saying, let's censor the historic museums because somebody might get their feelings hurt. So that's my opinion on that matter. Actually, yes, every museum has criteria that they can sign up for those That's why I strongly encourage you to join the board. I did, I did. I'm, I'm actually, I'm working with Bob Reiner. Good. Um, but I asked him about the criteria, and it doesn't exist. So I hope to help him Great. create that criteria Great. document because it's really pretty common. Good. I actually strongly encourage you. I just don't believe that. What's been advocated, I think, in the media, which is that the government, for example, the county should be stepping in to stick their fingers in the private nonprofit historic museums to direct them to, to appease, I think, the people who hate American history. So, you know, yes, I, I, I think there's a lot of people in this room who disagree with you strongly. Sure. Okay, yeah. on this point. There's a say. few. Yeah, that's quite enough. There's a lot of us that agree with you. It's an evenly divided crowd, which makes it interesting. I like that. Good.
Because you said everybody in this room. Oh, okay, then I just spoke. I, I wasn't saying that everybody agrees with that. It's a new point. I think I meant in the media. Maybe that's what I said. I must have spoken. Because it was the media uh, conversation driven by columnists that try to act like the history museums need to defend their their placement of historic well, objects. Did, did, did yes, sir. To, to, to speak a second on censorship, um, as somebody who lives in your district, I think your, your public access on your political page on Facebook shouldn't be censored in such a way that unless a comment is derogatory uh, for language or such, those comments shouldn't be deleted and people should never be blocked. Um, there's actually a lawsuit against somebody in the house right now over that. Sir, yeah, real quick on that. Uh, Facebook is not a traditional public forum. So if I have a Facebook page and whether I'm a private citizen or a public citizen, there's no right allowance or expectation for a person to be able to say, everyone can litter the page on my page with whatever, criticisms, whatever. I strongly encourage, strongly encourage anyone to have a conversation about what I'm doing, the legislature, the county, whatever, anyone on Facebook. But if I'm running my own page, it is my right to censor or modify or regulate my own page, just like yours is, whether you're a citizen, publicly or privately. So I put myself out to the public all the time. My cell phone goes on everything I do. But when I go on my Facebook page, I like to run it the way I think a person wants to run their own page, which is, you know, I like feedback. I like engagement. I don't delete every negative viewpoint. But if somebody's on there just to be an antagonist, just to mess with me, they have all the world of Facebook in order to do that. They have a limited amount of forums. They have their own page. They have literally all the public newspaper uh, area where people comment, all that. So it doesn't make sense why somebody should think that their own page should be allowed for that sort of uh, well, it wasn't views your or criticism. Page, though, it, was your, it wasn't your personal page, it was your political page. So, I so, do believe Sunshine Law has yeah. some stipulations Just to be why there's a current lawsuit ongoing. So yeah, yeah, so it's a lawsuit, not a, not a, not a case decision, not a verdict. Uh, somebody's mad that a public official in a different part of the state uh, doesn't allow, you know, attacks or criticism or whatever on his own page. The page, although I'm a state representative, is still my personal page. But right? you're using it as so, a government employee. No, I'm not. You're on no, I'm not. Just, just so you're clear on the law, a government page is something that taxpayers pay for. So if uh, y'all paid me, I had a website, Lake County, you know, website, whatever. Then I couldn't modify everything else. But if I'm it's my sure page, I start on Facebook. Off, it's called ownership. So you, I own the page. You own your page. So just so you're clear on law, I do encourage you to read the lawsuits. You'll see that they're totally frivolous. I Most of them going on for half a decade. Yes, ma'am. I think you're using it during the hours. Say again. You are using it on the clock on your big page. There's no work hours in the legislature. <laughs> I hate to admit that, but it's just you're here. I mean, I'm here. This, are these work hours? Yeah. I don't know. Okay, well, in that case, I mean, you don't have to be here. I don't have to be here. I do this. I, everything's discretionary. There's no law on it. See, I'm not an employee of the state, a traditional employee. Just so, I just want. I just. I hope you guys are clear about that because it's you know those who who say you know. Hey, that guy's in public office, so they should use their, they should allow their social media to get turned into a punching bag. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why people even allow that. I got my Facebook page, you got yours. Maybe I'll go on yours one day, but not for now. No. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question in reference to, I know Stephen Fuller has been really been encouraging charter schools, and I know that, that the scholarships that are going out now, uh, so, that, so that parents can choose to take their kids out of a, of a they believe is a failing public school to be able to put it in a charter school. But then that failing public school is not going to need less money to be able to try and... Untrue. Uh, so, not to cut you off, but I just want to leave you with that. So it is, it is so. So, because yeah. I, I know the, the, the public school system generally gets a certain amount of money per student enrolled in that school. Is that correct? Yeah, so you're saying they should be entitled to the money for the student that's not there? No, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just you know. I just want to, I want to explain the fuzzy logic on the public school funding, but I'll let you finish your question. Well, my, my question, my question is, I'm, I'm concerned that the direction that these uh, charter schools are taking public education, uh, if it turns out that the charter schools are not doing the job they claim to be doing or actually failing our students, 
yes, they may be sending the kids home with A's, the parents are happy, the students are happy, but when they move on to their education, they aren't prepared for college. Uh, just because they have the warm fuzzies from the charter school, is, is there going to be a way for us to backtrack and say, hey, look, the charter schools aren't working for us, we need to rebuild our public schools? So there are some, there are some areas of the country where they put all their eggs in the charter school basket, and it's been a disaster um, for, for kids in the well, no, system. Thanks for this question. Nowhere more than Florida has our charter schools been promoted and used. We're in the leading charter school state. I think Ohio is the second most. There's cities where it's heavy, but, but in terms of state, nobody's had as much input as we do. The, there's been success. Florida has a great education system. It's getting better every year. But one thing on the funding mechanism, and first let me say, funding for schools does not equate neatly to outcomes. You can throw money at failing schools all day and generally not change the outcomes, and that's been proven. If, uh, well, I, I, do, I do know that they kind of teachers are among the, the lowest paid. Yeah, yeah, I believe they should be paid. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, that's I'm sorry, but you, you, you yeah. Hold on, I mean, hold on. Let's try to keep it. The low pay really attracts you. Gentlemen, 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 gentlemen. Hey, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, very. You guys are carry, getting carried away. I go to hey, school board meetings for 15 hey, guys, years. I don't moderate these things, but let's. Let's keep, let's please be able to keep it that way. I do want to say one thing. The, the money that the schools get increases every single year, despite the amount of students, obviously a huge increase of students going to charge schools. Normal public school, traditional public school student like myself, is getting more dollars per, cla per classroom in the, in the student in the classroom every single year on top of that. So they try to spell this logic out and. I think some of these liberal newspaper columns where they say, well, otherwise they would have made more money if the students stay there. Yeah, well, the students didn't stay there. you got to convince their parents that they should go there. I mean, the legislature's not getting here dictating where the students should go. We're opening it up for the free market, per se. We're, we're allowing parents to choose where the students should go. And the truth of the matter is, it's really hard for me to get involved and tell a parent, no, I don't care what you say, your kid's going to go to this school. The parents, I mean, do you... You probably ostensibly agree that parents should be able to choose where their kid is going to school. And, I mean, if the school's not doing well, I trust that parent. I trust that parent to take that kid out of that school. And you might not like the results of what the school overall is doing, but it might be working for that child. And no metric on the school grading system is going to show you that that child is actually getting a good experience there. I went to Eustis High School. It was a C school. No doubt, most people in Central Florida would look at it and be like, that's a C school. How could that possibly be considered a good school? I'm not even going to consider putting my kid in there. Really? Because I did quite well there. And just one moment, I'm going to finish this. And then one of my very good friends who went to Vanderbilt and Wharton for his MBA also went to that same public school. And he did dual enrollment at Lake Sumter like we all did. So long story short, we're talking about you know parents being in charge of the students. And we're, as a legislature, just trying to get out of the way. And I think they're the ones that hold them accountable. Yes, ma'am. And that's why I keep, you know, you're promoting the charter schools. But if they are important and they're doing the job, why are they not required to have the same standards that our public schools The teachers are not required to have the same grade level. They are not required to take the same tests. They are not required to even report the if they're why are the standards not well they, they thank you for the question they're reporting things to the state just not as comprehensive it's exper it's an experimental innovative model parents trust it they're they're treating they're treating the, the, treating the students different they're treating the teachers different they're treating the whole system different the truth of the matter is it's an option it's a choice these parents don't have to send their kids there. they can say you know what this this school doesn't pay their teachers as much or they didn't report this metric to the state last year i'm not sending my school there and i respect that choice of that parent uh, but I'm not going to take away the choice of another parent to take put their kid in that in that sort of school system uh, because of the fact that they don't think that it's good that the charter schools are paying the teacher enough or that they're not uh, sending enough information to the state every year. Once again, I put the parents first. That's how I look at this as a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, seems like you're a proponent of home rule, I'm pointing to you. Um, which is that the state government puts the law and the city governments or the village governments cannot change that law, like they can't make their own decisions. I remember that Representative Moskowitz, when Parkland occurred, and his people came to him and said, you know, do something. And he said, I can't because of home rule. Okay. 
Okay? So, my question is, if, if we can't change anything in, in Lake County, why do we need you at all? Because if, you're, if, if, the, if Tallahassee is going to do what, what they're going to do, and we can't change it, if you don't really represent us, all right, first of in all, I'm, I'm asking a serious question, okay. Now, okay? If you're not really representing us because of home rule, I'm not, I'm not blaming you for home rule. It's been there for a while. I'm just saying, why does anybody in the state need representatives if, if it's, you know, there's nothing we can do about the rules that are created? Let me just reorient you because you, I think you've mixed up this issue. So home rule exists broadly in Florida. Yes. Where I think Representative Moskowitz mentioned it was the restriction on home rule that Tallahassee has created. We create restrictions on home rule when home rule is being abused. 99.9% .9 of what the city of Claremont and most cities are doing is not my concern. They're doing a good job. I, we don't get involved in Tallahassee. But every once in a while, generally not here in Lake County, but in some cities, usually in other cities around the county, they steer way outside their lane. So Tallahassee decides that they need to step in and create restrictions on home rule. So I think your question meant to say, if you're going to create restrictions on home rule, then why do we need, I, I, actually I don't even understand the question at all, but I, I will say this, I'm your state representative. The state legislature is what creates all the local governments and regulates them. It's also, the state also, the state's actually also created the federal government. The state is the heart of the entire American system. And the lower house, the Florida House of Representatives, is the, is the, is the body that's closest to the people. So, you know, you have a state representative, so they make laws for your state. And when they decide that the creations that they make, local governments, need to be restricted in some way, they do it. And generally, it's because those local governments are getting in the way of the rights and the abilities of their own citizens. I oftentimes don't, I, I do not believe that oftentimes local government even reflects its own constituents. They get involved in very low turnout elections, they make regulations, they hardly get any input from the community. But the, the same people, people who are in local no. government offices are the same people who are elected me. It's the same people. So they That's know. That's what I'm saying. Why do we need the position? I'm not blaming. I'm not saying you. But why do we need this whole legislature if everything's going to be decided up in We can just have one giant government no, I mean, out of nations. No, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what to tell you. I get philosophical, but that's a little heavy philosophical. I want to go back to the charter school sure. issue. Um, there was a debacle earlier in the year that I was part of. Um, anyways, um, I, was, I know that uh, Tallahassee is really big on uh, charter schools. Obviously, you are too, and they're real adamant about how important they are. And why I don't criticize or think that uh, parents shouldn't have the ability to choose for their students. However, I think a lot of these charter schools need to be uh, more heavily vetted. Uh, the charter school that I went up against uh, in October, remember, um, was not a good, not a good school. <laughs> they were shady. They were for profit, and they got free money from the government, and they were for profit at the same time. I know some charter schools aren't for profit. This one was for profit, and would get free money from the government, and yet they were able to have their own, uh, their own set of standards. You know what they wanted to do, what they wanted to teach. Um, this particular was Charter Schools USA, to be exact. Um, we did, I did a lot of research on them um, because, like I said, I went up against them, sued them. We'll sue the city for making a stupid decision with their uh, CUP to build here. But um, anyways, uh, doing research on them, they were a CD school. Um, some of them were failing. Uh, Lake County School Board kind of frustrated me because they allowed them their charter. Uh, because they were because Tallahassee is so oh we love charter schools, they went ahead. They were against this charter school, but went ahead, went ahead and gave them their charter because they knew that they would take it to Tallahassee. And uh, Lake County School Board didn't want to waste uh, money going up against them in the lawsuit because they figured that they would lose. So when is Tallahassee going to like you know start vetting these charter schools a little bit more heavily because they are shady. They 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 do open book testing. I'm not saying all of them. There are some good ones. I'm not saying all of them, but there, yeah. this one in particular, the 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 guy that actually owns Charter Schools USA or started it, uh, they did an article on him, I think it was in the Orlando Sentinel a couple years back. 
you wouldn't even let his kids go to Charter School USA. So what does that tell you, Charter School USA um, schools? But what I'm saying is, if they're going to be a gung-ho about getting these charter schools here, they need to vet them better because they're doing some shady things. Trust me, I know. They lie. They lie during their presentation to city council to, to, for the developer to get their CUP on this certain property that yeah. I... Um, it just upsets me. And, and like the gentleman said, they do. They, they go into certain areas because they bleed off A schools, which are public schools, and they steal their money. So then my kid going to a public school is getting crap books or crap uh, electronics or whatever because the charter schools are basically stealing the money because they're they're leading our schools. Yeah. Okay, and there's a lot there. Thank you very much for that concern. And I followed the issue here in Claremont, which was a local government issue. They allowed the charter school to uh, get an amendment to their comprehensive plan that uh, they weren't entitled to. So, right. Uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I don't know the details of it. I, I do know that I trust the judge, and the judge did. I knew the judge, and I'm sure he made well, the Well, they're appealing it now, FYI. Okay, so we're yeah. But yeah, I mean, there a lot of discretion for the trial court judge, so I'm sure it's fine. But back to the main issue. Charter schools, once again, I come with a philosophical perspective of experimentation, innovation, trusting parents, allowing the, 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 the parents to choose. Uh, schools are really pretty good. <laughs> Uh, especially based on historical patterns. I mean, I think these schools have gotten very good. A lot of parents don't want to send their kids to charter schools. They are satisfied with the public schools or uh, the, the public schools. So the idea is to allow these charter schools to compete. But the truth of the matter is, like I think I'm quoting our superintendent here: if the public schools are doing a good job, these charter schools aren't going to be able to compete. And if they are able to compete, what does that tell you? It means they're not branding well. Uh, back to in the factual specific, uh, back to the factually specific uh, 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 thing you mentioned about peeling off money funds from the public schools. The truth of the matter is, they're only splitting the capital costs and, and, and classroom costs and the dollars are coming from the school board uh, are only coming from how many students go there. So it's not like they're just getting you know 150 million dollars from the school board and hopefully they can fill the seats. They're getting money as they grow. If they're competing with the public schools. And they're winning, they get more money. Uh, ideally, I'd like to see a great school board, right, where uh, we don't have uh, a lot of charter schools because there's no need for competition because they're just so great. But the truth of the matter is, the competition, I think, leads us in that direction. I'm new, I'm a freshman, I've been here six months, so I'm still learning a little bit on the issue. I've been uh, kind of disappointed by the issues and abuses by a certain percentage of the charter schools you've seen, especially in the urban areas like in Orlando, where they allow some of these teachers to teach who really aren't certified. So I'm very open-minded about the oversight of charter schools. Um, but right now, I haven't seen anything factually or evidence that has been put forward that this regulation of charter schools, I think, would make them better right now. Right now, it's just, hey, uh, we don't like the charter schools. But if you want to talk about a specific idea going forward, we can talk about it next year. I happen to be uh, co uh, Representatives with another representative of the Worthley County is the chair of the Education Committee in the Florida House of Representatives, Representative Jennifer Sullivan. She's literally the chair. So she's got quite a say on it. Um, but my, my, but my main concern is the vetting of these schools because they're not forthcoming when they present to, to obtain their charters. And for our own Lake County School Board to like put their tail between their legs because they didn't want to fight them in Tallahassee, it's pretty sad when Tallahassee and Bethel were married that our own. Because they did not want to give them that charter. They already denied them one time previously. But they came back before them and they knew they were going to fight in Tallahassee. And since Tallahassee is for a charter, they just didn't have concern they're going to charter. Well, that's a good thing. And that, that, that's not the way it should work. Our county government work that should be able to no. do what they want. We're not fearing what Tallahassee is going to do. I'll, I, I apologize, but I have to get schooled up on it because I don't know if there's any merit to the idea of. Hey, let's not challenge their application because it's going to lose us a bunch of money. I mean, is it really yes. a card that's stacked against them? I don't know what the criteria that the Department of Education uses to approve a charter school. I know they've been denied in the past in different counties. I have friends who work in education, and they've said that charter schools can't apply and fail miserably and never open. Um, but once again, you know, uh, I'll have to see what. I'm very open minded on the actual language. If somebody put a bill in front of me and said, here are the requirements we're going to put on the charter schools, this will make them more effective put the taxpayers and, and citizens back in charge and give better oversight of the charter schools, I might vote up on it. So, you know, please come and do it.
bills, but right now I can see anything proposed this year that, uh, that I would have voted on. My understanding is that they may have tweaked that bedding in Tallahassee because they just had a case with the charter. Well, they almost. In Lake County, there was a where they denied it, and they said because this group thinks that they're going to get right through in Tallahassee by challenging it, mm -hmm. but that it had been tweaked so that that is not as likely. Yeah, let me, let me look. Come to my office, bring some ideas of what, what's happening, what you think, and I'll give you my opinion on it. But right now, I think it's all factually specific. I don't know what the specific regulation needs to be to make these charts look better and more accountable. Yes, sir. It's just a comment. I've been, so what I've found is that when you guys are talking about money in charter schools, it seems that you always associate money with technology. But what I've found is it's about the students and the teachers. It doesn't matter and the parents. what money you have. And like, just because I've outscored people that are that are going to Ivy Leagues and they've had tablets and stuff, and I've had coffee stained books. It's about our teachers. If you keep focusing our, our money on just technology, and that's your metric. I wasn't using, focusing just on that. I was just giving that as an example. As an example, like our kids have crap, and then but, they start But it's just that's just what I've I've just heard that from lots of people. So that's what I'm saying. Is it's well, as a young about student, about I, I take that opinion seriously, and it's a big. And I hope that people understand that we need the best that we can. And yeah, it should just be used on technology no one uses. I've heard crazy stories about stacks of iPads sitting in closets at schools because they're missing one part and they can't use it, even though they have $150,000 technology investment in one school. It doesn't get utilized. So, um, not to cop out, but a lot of it does have to do with getting the absolute best people you possibly can on school boards. Um, I think school boards. It's hard to get good people to run for office, particularly local office. I think it's just ugly, and they think it takes way more time than it does. And so talented, smart, good people don't run. Uh, and you get stuck with, like, stooges and stuff and people who just don't even really should be there. So we, I think the answer is if you think you can do a good job at the school board executing good policy, you should run. And I'm not <laughs> saying that this is just, like, throwing it back at you, but I really mean that. Uh, when I was a first year law school, I was like, I don't think anyone in this, my city council is good. So I ran for city council. That was it. And I like to think. Here too, city council. Yeah. They, just, they don't know why half people are up there. 14, up there. 14 cities in Lake County, a water authority, a <laughs> county uh, commission, a school board. Uh, there's a lot of government here. There's a lot of spots and there's a lot of uncompetitive races. So I encourage you, if you don't think it's something's being done, why don't you run? Questions? I'll go all night. I don't care. All right. I, I, I think also, you know, a lot of times people talk about, you know, oh, the schools are not very good. Um, what I tend to find is that there are some top, top notch students graduating from public oh schools, God. and it has all the difference to do with the parents in cooperation with the teachers. If a, if a student is failing at a school, it's not the school's fault. It's like nine times out of ten, it's the parents who just pass it off to the school. Oh, the school's not doing my kid what I want to do, so I'm going to put him in this charter school. That's an honest and I've seen I've seen pressure brought to bear on a teacher to change the grade of a student that didn't deserve the the higher grade yeah. in, a, in a private institution. No, it's absolutely true. There's like he gets dropped out of the media conversation. The, the grading system, which got created in '94, '95 in Florida, Walter Charles, uh, created this weird effect where if a school was a B or a C or a D, but had an outstanding programs that might have been good for certain types of students or whatever, parents just were adverse to it and did not want to send their kids there. And so there was a drain effect. And, better as kids or more involved parents or whatever went to other schools <coughs> and hurt those schools in force. Uh, like I said, I went to a C school. It was a great high school. I mean, it was really a great community. Uh, Extracurricular, extra sports, dual enrollment, IB, AP, all this great stuff. Well, actually, IB came later, but all these things offered. And we had, we had kids go, we had a kid except to Harvard in the class before me. So, like, most of it is just pure two-dimensional media narrative about the way schools are because they're a B or a C when they're actually good schools. So um, I, I encourage everyone to dig deeper and really look at how schools are performing more than just a letter grade. Just because there's a lot of students who are 
having a tough time with the standardized test at that school doesn't mean it's a bad school. That just gets left out of their conversation. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, I was a teacher in another state for a uh, public school teacher for almost 30 years. And one of the things that I found is that when children had behavior problems, they were eliminated from charter schools. And they had to go to public schools because unless their parents were paid for something private, which they would get kicked out of anyway because of their behavior. Mm -hmm. So um, also there were programs that, in charter schools that didn't address English as a second language. So those kids who didn't speak the language were couldn't go to those charter schools. And children, um, they didn't always have sufficient programs for children who need, had special needs or uh, health needs or um, needed special education. And so all of those children who maybe started out in charter schools were weeded out of the charter schools back into the public schools. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's creating a problem for our public schools, which are, uh, which are the basis of our public education. It's really important education. Like you said, you went to a school you thought it was great and you did pretty good, right? So this is a concern that like the schools, those schools are concentrating, are getting concentrated with students who the charter schools don't want. And it's unfair that they can just just say, you know, it's not working. Yeah. Okay. Seems like a real well, I appreciate that. It's a valid concern. Yes, Nick? Yeah. I'm concerned about that. Focus on actually helping the people's lives 
that they're in charge of and not, not virtue signaling or media attention. Any other questions? Yeah, paper is strong. It's perfectly good for getting the job done. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like a paper towel in your mouth. Yeah. Easy to throw it away. Hey, it's, it's, yeah. but once again, honestly, if you have, and there's bills I filed that didn't make it through. I had a great bill on constitutional officers' budgets being more transparent. That was lobbied against and killed, and I plan to file that again in the future. So if you have a good idea, and a lot of the best ideas literally are just off the cuff comments from people who kind of fire arm rights for 18 to 21 year olds. Yep. So let me know.